God is good. Amen. Amen. Thank everybody for being here this morning. Uh, I'll get the elephant out of the room. Now, most of you know I'm wearing a hat, not to be disrespectful to the house of God. It's just I had some surgery uh, on my hip, some cancer spots, and until I get all that resolved, you're going to see me in a hat, okay? And I want to thank everybody for the prayers. They've got everything that's supposed to be gotten, and I think they did a good job on everything. It's just a matter of healing now. God's in charge of that. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Let's hope our Bibles. Let me let me shout out to Facebook and YouTube. Those on Facebook and YouTube that are joining us this morning, we appreciate you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know. We appreciate your prayer. We appreciate your support. All right. Let's hope our Bible making confession this morning. Say it like you mean it. Mean it like you said. This is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I'm a winner, not a whiner. I'm a doer, not just a hearer. I said I'm a doer, not just a hearer. In Jesus' name. All right, y'all sound good this morning. The Bible says we're all part of the body of Christ, so I'll turn to somebody in front of you, behind you, next to you, and say, Thank God you brought the rest of my body this morning. Hey God, thank God you brought the rest of my body. Now tell somebody God loves you and so do I. God loves you and so do I. Church, I'm going to pray before I get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you. We come before your throne of grace this morning. Father God, that this morning we didn't come just to hear a 30 minute sermon, Father. We come to hear a word from you. And I ask Father God you help me to decrease the Holy Spirit increase. I thank you for anointing my heart, my mind, my mouth, my lips, and the words that come out of my mouth. Let them glorify you and edify your people. And Lord God, I just thank you this morning that your word is going to fall on fertile soil. And Lord, that we're not going to be the same. We're going to be changed because you're a living word that we apply in our lives. Father, I give you all the honor, all the praise, and all the glory. And I do it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 All right. If you will turn with me, Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Begin at verse 22. And she turned there, the Bible said, Mary heart goes good like medicine. So I got you some medicine this morning, okay? Remember, these are just humorous stories, so please don't be offended. The fact that Walmart can tell I paid with a $5 bill and my Q tips didn't scan, but the White House doesn't know how the coat got there is entirely too funny. Well, let's try this one. Advice from an old farmer. Your fences need to be horse high, pig tight, and bull strong. Keep stumps and bankers at a distance. Life is simpler when you plow around the stump. A bumblebee is considerably faster than a John Deere tractor. Words that soak into your ears are whispered, not yelled. Forgive your enemies, it messes up their heads. Do not corner something that you know is meaner than you. That's good advice, amen? It don't take a very big person to carry a grudge. Every path has a few puddles. When you wallow with pigs, expect to get dirty. The best sermons are lived, not preached. Amen. Most of the stuff people worry about ain't never going to happen anyway. That's good advice too. Don't judge folks. Don't judge folks by their relatives. <laughs> Remember that silence is sometimes the best answer. Live a good, honorable life that then when you get older and think back, you'll enjoy it a second time. Don't interfere with something that ain't bothering you none. If you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. Sometimes you get and sometimes you get got. That's true too. The biggest troublemaker you'll probably ever have to deal with watches you from the mirror every morning. Well, there's a lot of truth to that one. Here's a good one. Always drink upstream from the herd. Good judgment comes from experience, and a lot, a lot of that comes from bad judgment. Ain't that the truth? Let the cat out of the bag a whole lot easier than putting it back in. If you get, if you get to thinking you're somebody, somebody of influence, try to order somebody else's dog around. It says live simply, love generously, care deeply, speak kindly, and leave the rest to God. And don't pick a fight with an old man. If he's too old to fight, he'll just kill you. That's right. 
Most of the time, it just gets down to common sense. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. And straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get in the ship and to go before him into the other side while he sent the multitudes away. They just got through feeding the 5,000 people, plus the children and the wives. They just got through doing a miraculous thing, okay? And he said, and when he had sent the multitude away, he went up to a mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went into went into them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straight away, Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. Say, Come. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw, say Saul, Saul. when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore did thou doubt? And when, the, when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. And then they were in the ship, came and worshipped him, saying, Of truth, thou art the Son of God. Church, before I get into our message this morning, there's a couple more scriptures I want to give you because I really want this to go get in our hearts this morning. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and Jesus went about all of Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manners of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. What was Jesus doing? He was teaching and he was preaching the truth. And when the people heard the truth, Jesus was able to heal them from all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. See, the devil will lie to you and say, oh, hey, God, let that happen to you. God doesn't put sickness and disease on his church. The enemy does that. Amen? Yeah. Now, this is the scripture I really want you to listen to. Proverbs 4, verse 20. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It's about, it says, my son, attend to my words. In other words, pay attention to what God's saying. Don't pay attention to what I'm saying. Pay attention to what God's saying. Incline thy ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes, but keep them in the midst of thy heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. This morning, church, we're going to hear God's word. And God says, listen to what I'm saying. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Don't worry about what may happen tomorrow or what happened yesterday. Listen to what I'm saying to you today. He said, because my words are life to those that find them. I mean, not everybody's going to get a hold of it. But some of them are going to get a hold of it this morning. Amen? Amen. And he said, they're health to all your flesh. I don't know about you, but I need help to my flesh. Amen. Amen. So listen, pay attention to what God is saying. This morning, what I'm going to talk to you about is the risk. There's a balance we live by every day. It's a balance of risk versus reward. Every believer must ask himself, is it worth the risk to follow Jesus into the faith zone? Or will you live the rest of your life sitting in a safe zone? See, when Jesus says come, he just opened the door for you to a greater life than you can imagine. But it's going to cost you something. There's going to be a risk. Now let me say this to you. Life comes with a risk, church. Every time we get on the freeway, you're taking a risk. That's right. Every time you get on an airplane, you're taking a risk. Every time you let them put you under for surgery, you're taking a risk. Some risks are big, some are small. Every time you deposit money in your bank account, you're taking a risk. Every time you get your hair done, you're taking a risk that they won't turn it green. Every time you take a drug with 37 side effects, you're taking a risk. And let me put this right in here with you. Life with Jesus comes with a risk. When Jesus walked on the earth, he was hated by the religious system. They wanted to kill him. It was a risk just to be seen with the church. It was taking your life in your own hands just to be part of his ministry team. But I believe this morning, before this message is over, somebody here this morning, you're going to hear Jesus say, come. And you're going to have to decide, is it worth the risk? And listen, it's going to be just as real for you as it was for Peter on that stormy night. 
Jesus has not changed. And he's still calling people to walk on the water. If somebody's listening to this message is going to hear that unmistakable voice, and your life is never going to be the same. Somebody's going to hear it. Say, come. Come out of what you've been into. Come, let's do what looks impossible. I'm going to help you to do the impossible. To overcome the thing that people said was never possible. To change your life like you never thought it could be changed. Amen? Come is really just another way of him saying, you can do it. It's your turn. You ever feel like everybody else is getting blessed and everybody else's life is so good? You're thinking, what about me, Lord? Well, God's telling somebody this morning, it's your turn. It's time to start. It's time to go. Quit making excuses and break free from your fears and start living your faith. So many of God's people are living below their potential, church. They live in what we call a safe zone. Oh, we come to church. We go through the motions. We listen to the sermon. We pray for people. We sing them songs. And then we go home. But nothing changes. God wants to be something that's going to change your life. When you hook up a life, something's going to change. When you give your heart to God, we're talking about this morning about that. When you give your heart to God, Jesus says, I do a spiritual circumcision on your heart. He cuts away that old flesh nature. When you really give your heart to God, there is a heart change. Listen, everything you're not may not change overnight, but you have a heart change. You want something different. You want to learn about God. You want to go closer to God. You want to read. You want to pray. You want to be around the people of God. You say, well, I don't have to go to church be saved. No, you don't have to go to church be saved. There's something wrong with your salvation. You don't want to come to God's house and be around God's people. Oh, come on. Listen, every once in a while, you run into somebody who heard Jesus say come, and they went over the edge of the comfortable and predictable safe zone, and they're following Jesus in the faith zone. So many times we sit back. In our comfortable, safe places, we talk about everything we would do for God if He called us. Listen, I told Josh and Richard I want to use them this morning. They were in California, and they believed they heard God. It was time to move. They did not know where they were going. They ended up in Temple, and they ended up coming to this little church. And listen, they have become such a blessing to this church. He kept us in so many ways. We reached out to people we never would have reached out before to because of what they've done. But listen, not only that, Joshua testified that he used to have leg pain really bad all the time. And God met that need and took care of that. Richard was homebound for eight years because of anxiety. He couldn't go out and be around other people. The church, God has set him free. He's sitting back there. He's coming to the church. Listen, they didn't know where they were going and what they were doing. They just knew they had heard from God that they needed to move. And they did what God told them to do, and God rewarded them for it, church. Amen. Nothing of any real lasting meaning or value has ever been accomplished without a risk. Risk is built into the faith question. Risk means the possibility that something unpleasant or unwelcome will happen. Risk means a situation involved involving exposure to danger. Sometimes serving God is going to be dangerous. Not everybody likes Christians. Not everybody loves God. Especially in the world we live in today. Amen? Amen. The risk means the possibility of loss. You may lose some things. You were talking about Job this morning. He lost everything he had. He lost his family. He lost his health. Lost all. But you know what? When it was all said and done, God turned around and gave him double what he had. That's the God we serve, amen? Amen. amen. Sometimes risk means the possibility of an outcome opposite of your desire. So many people get, desire, they get disappointed in God. They'll pray about something, and it doesn't work out the way they think it should work out, and so they get upset with God. You don't realize that God's working out the whole big picture. Yes. He looks at everything. He knows the beginning from the end. All we, we've got tunnel vision. All we can see is what we're going through right now. But God knows, church, and sometimes he does the things in our lives that we don't agree with, but it's going to help us in the end result. Amen? Amen. Listen, you and I most likely will never, ever get out of a boat and walk on water like Peter did. 
You may never, during the course of our lifetime, be in a situation or circumstance that Peter was in. When he literally, physically got out of his boat in the middle of this life-threatening storm, and physically in the presence of our witness, and he walked on top of the water. But while we may never physically leave the safety of a perfectly good boat and leap out into a raging sea, there will be times in our lives as we follow Christ that we'll be faced with a decision between risk or safety. And we'll be challenged to duplicate that same reckless risk of faith and abandon that Peter had when he let go of everything so he could hold on to nothing but a word. Listen, he didn't have anything but Jesus saying, come. He had to step out of the boat, that place of safety and security. And he had to let go of everything that was secure in his life and trust the word of God. Sometimes, church, when doctors say you've got six months to live, who are you going to believe? You've got to trust the word of God. Amen. Amen. That's right. Amen. There's going to be a time and a point in your faith journey when you have to choose the high road or the low road. If you choose the high road, it means you'll have to let go. You'll have to let go of the safe place. Well, I do, God, if you just tell me what's going to happen out here. Listen, when you walk by faith, God tells you step by step. He doesn't always tell you the end result, church. Sometimes we knew the end result, we wouldn't walk by faith. But he, he tells you to walk every step, day by day. And you have to turn loose of those safe places, that security. Sometimes you've got to let go of those things in your life that's been hindering you, holding you back. We've been preaching on Wednesday night about out of uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. He said, God has already given us everything that pertains unto life and to godliness. Through these precious promises that we might be partakers of his divine nature. God, church, the word says God has already given, past tense, past, given us everything you need to live a victorious Christian life. Now, like the word said a while ago, not everybody's going to find it. But he's given it to us, church. Amen? And he said, through these precious promises, we're going to become partakers of his nature. But he also told the people, when he told Israel, he told Israel, go into the land that I have given you. Past tense, hath given the promised land. But he said, when you get there, there's going to be some ice in that land. And he said, you've got to dispossess the inhabitants of the land so you can possess the promise that I've already given you. Listen, we've got some ice in our lives. We've got some things in our lives that are keeping us from receiving what God wants us to have, what God wants to do in our life. And God says, you've got to get rid of those things out of your life because they're blockage, they're hindrance, they keep the flow of the Holy Spirit from moving like he wants to. And in Deuteronomy 7, he said, when you get, when you dispossess these inhabitants, he said, you've got to totally wipe them out. He said, show them no mercy and don't compromise with them. I heard people say, well, I just had one drink, or I just had one toast, or I just had one sniff. You know what? That's all it takes sometimes. And it opens a door. You can't play with sin. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and make you pay more than you want to pay. Amen? Amen. That's right. The greater the challenge, the higher the risk level. When God tells you to do something, to step out and do something, you're going to have to trust Him. You're going to have to do. In other words, He's telling you to do something you can't do in yourself. But when you trust Him, you'll be amazed what you can do. Amen. What God can do through you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Listen. Having said all that, I want to say it takes a certain measure of faith just to ride out in the storm. It takes a certain measure of faith to keep your sanity when all hell is breaking loose against you and your family. Your finances, your health, or your ministry. Some people are quick to criticize the disciples because they weren't willing to take the risk. And they categorize them as being fearful and faithless. Peter's the only one stepped out of the boat. The rest of them stayed in a place of safety. And sometimes we say, oh, look, at, look what Peter did, but look at the rest of them. They're just sitting in a boat. Listen, I'm not criticizing them because I know how it feels to be in a storm. And I know how much faith it takes just to stay in the boat. And you know what I mean. When all hell is breaking loose, for you to keep on praising God, for you to keep on trusting God, for you to keep on tithing, keep on sowing, keep on confessing. Yes. When you can't see any relief in sight, and when you can't feel any relief, you couldn't see anything but storm clouds and rough water. No, I'm not condemning them. They made it through the storm. They made it to the other side. That, praise God, they made it, church. There's something to shout about right there. Amen? Listen, I made it. 
I didn't feel like I was going to make it sometime. I didn't look like I was going to make it sometime. And people said I wouldn't make it, but you know what? I'm here. People said the same thing about y'all, that you're here this morning. Amen? Yeah. And that's because of the grace and the mercy of God. I'm not going to criticize them. I have only one thing to say about those other disciples. They missed the opportunity to take the high road. They were brought to a place where they could have chosen greater glory. They missed the testimony of a water walker. All they had was a survival testimony. We survived and rode out the storm. And I don't know about you. I want more than just a survival story. I want to be able to talk about the storm that I put under my feet with Jesus' help. I want to talk, tell somebody about the Goliath that I killed with Come God's on. help. I want to tell somebody about the sickness that tried to kill me, but I beat it with God's help. I want to tell somebody about how I destroyed, destroyed poverty and lack out of my life with God's help. I want to tell, show somebody how I defeated fear, anxiety, and worry with God's help. I want to testify about some personal battle that ended in my victory over the devil with God's help, church. Amen. Amen. A survival testimony is good, but when Peter began to testify, his testimony was different. Yes, he was in the boat with all the rest. Yes, he feared for his life like all the disciples. But when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water, something on the inside of Peter told him, you can do that. Amen. If Jesus can do that, so can you. Amen. Amen. Something on the inside of Peter said, if the teacher can do it, so can the student. All he needed was a word from the master. Listen, John 14, 12 says, Whoever believes in me will do the works that I do, and even greater work will he do, because I go to the Father. Now, people say, oh, you can't do greater works than Jesus. That's not what he's saying, church. When Jesus was here on the earth, he could only be at one place at one time. But now, because he put the Father and sent back the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us, so we can be in many places doing many miracles. Amen? Amen. Oh, come on. Say, oh, God, God is good with you. Man, you just don't know. Listen, God says, I use the food saint to confound the life. That's right. Amen. 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 All you need is a can do word. If you remember the story, Peter fished all night. He's a professional fisherman. He fished all night long. Disappointed, he didn't catch nothing. And Jesus told him, Cast your net on the other side. And Peter said, Nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to do it. And when he cast the net on the other side, he caught 153 fish. The nets almost began to break. All he needed was a word from God, church. All you need is a word from God. Amen? Amen. Listen, sometimes God will speak to you in a small, still voice. Sometimes, we're so, God told me one time, you're so busy, you're moving all the time, you don't have time to hear me. Sometimes we just got to get still and listen to that small, small, still voice. What is God saying to me? We always want to go to an evangelist or, or pastors. Lord, what, what's the Lord saying to you? No, you need to be able to hear God for yourself. Especially in the days we're entering church, you're not going to be able to run some pastor somewhere or some preacher. You need to hear from God yourself. Amen. Right, Sometimes God will speak to you. You ever read your Bible and all of a sudden it's like you get a aha moment. A light bulb goes off. And you see something you never saw before. Sometimes God will speak to you through scripture also. Amen. Amen. Listen, there may be a thousand voices telling you can't do it. And a thousand reasons why you can't do it. Oh, you're just not educated enough. You're not old enough. Or you're too old. <laughs> or you're too sick. Or you're the wrong color. Or you're from the wrong side of town. Or you don't have enough money. Or you don't have any experience. Listen, when God spoke to me about opening this church, I didn't have any experience. I didn't, I didn't know anything about being a pastor or running a church. I just knew that God said, open this church up. And I opened this church up, and I've learned, and I've grown along as I've gone and done it. But I didn't have any experience, but God didn't hold that against me. He said, I just want somebody that's willing. Because you and I, we make a majority, me and you and God. Amen? Amen. So God's looking for somebody. Listen, God has taken care of this church all these years. Yes. Because it was founded the way he said it founded. He's taken care of me. He's made me a better person, a better pastor. Over the years, it took time. Amen? Amen? So don't say, well, I just don't have no experience. Listen, God can take you and use you. You'd be surprised what he can do with you. Amen? Amen. That's right. Amen. Well, sometimes he'll say, well, you just waited too long. 
Or you're just too far gone. Listen, I got a kid sitting right here, my grandson. He had to give up. When he heard Jesus speak to his heart, he had to give up everything. He had to let go of all those things that he was holding on to and that was holding on to him. But he said, the Lord spoke to him the word surrender. Sometimes I think every Christian with God would speak that to all of us. Surrender. Yeah. And he said, when I did, I surrendered my heart to God. I preached a sermon a while back that God can do exceedingly above above all of the after thing. And I tell God all the time, that's an answer to prayer. That's above or bond, beyond anything. Listen, I never thought I'd have a relationship with my grandson. Before he got saved, and he don't mind me telling you this, he was like me. I, I come out of a messed up situation. He was living on the streets, bound by drugs, alcohol, all these things. But you know what? God came into his life, spoke a word to him, and he accepted what God said. And he stepped out of the boat, and he began to do things. That, listen, if you're around him, you're going to get saved, or you're going to get away from him. Come on. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's saving people. He's baptizing in a swimming pool in his backyard. He's out doing the Father's business. That's right, yeah. And then the natural people, oh, he'll never do that. They said the same thing about me. They said the same thing about you. But you know what? We're still here, and we're doing the thing that people said we couldn't do. That's because right. we're willing to listen to what God says. Amen? Yeah. If you have a can-do word from God, you can do the impossible. You can go where they said you'd never go. You can do what they said you'd never do. You can be what they said you could never be. And you can have what they said you could never have. It kind of sounds like our confession, doesn't it? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Listen, I'm going to read this to you. This is from Captain Coleman. Don't you listen? Faith is when you stop believing what you see and begin to see what you believe. I'll say that again. Yeah. Faith is when you stop believing what you see and you will begin to see what you believe. We will walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? Amen. 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 Listen, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do. Say can do. Can do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right. When somebody says, oh, I can't do this, you know what? You just have to fall alive in the devil because God says you can. Amen. Amen? You know me, listen, I'm an introvert outside of this pulpit. After she married me, she said, I didn't know you was mute. <laughs> but I'm not a conversationist. You call me up on the phone. I don't mean to be rude. I'll ask you what your problem is. I'll give you the answer. Say thank you. Goodbye. Call Pastor Joy. You can talk to her for two or three hours. <laughs> but I'm just not. But listen, I never dreamed I'd stand before people. I didn't like to be just in our kitchen. Don't worry about it. But God can take anybody and do anything if they're willing to just let God do it. Yes, Amen? That's right. Amen. Mark 9, 23 says, if, say if. If, if thou, so tell somebody he's talking to you. If thou can believe all things, how many? All. all things are possible to him that believeth. Not having believed, but continue to believe God. Like the song we said, Lord, regardless of circumstances, regardless of situation, I'm still going to trust in you. Amen. <laughs> 1 John 4, 4 says, You are God, little children, have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Church, the thing is, we just gotta, we got to learn how to let the greater one that's in us begin to show up. Yeah. Yeah. I was telling some Pastor Joy this, we was talking about Israel. Israel's surrounded by all these Muslim nations. Those Muslim nations are descendants of Ishmael. Yes. Okay? Jewish people are descendants of Isaac. Ishmael was the son of the flesh. Isaac was the son of the spirit. Amen. So you've got the flesh and the spirit, and the Bible says they're contrary to one another and they fight all the time, right? Yeah. Well, they're surrounded by all that flesh, and it's going to take God to come in the spirit and be able to deliver them. Because this is one time America's not going to be able to bring Israel out. God is going to bring Israel out. Israel's going to bow and accept him as a Messiah. Listen, it takes the Spirit of God, such as our spirit, to help us to overcome all that flesh that we've got to work through. Think about it. If somebody sees you and never met you before, what are they going to see? They're going to see the Jesus in you, or they're going to see your flesh? Got quiet on that one, didn't <laughs> All right. Listen. Peter had a can-do word. He said, come. 
That's all he had, church, but that's all he needed. Amen? Only God can turn a mess into a message, a test into a testimony, a trial into a triumph, and a victim into a victory. Amen. Only God can do that. Amen? Amen. 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 No doubt these disciples argued with Peter and told him, it's impossible to beg you to stay in the boat, to stay on the same level of faith they had. They probably said, don't risk it, Peter. But Peter had heard the call. Listen, sometimes when God tells you to do something, your family, your friends are going to try to keep you from stepping out and doing what God told you to do. But Peter had heard the call, church. And that's all he needed, amen? Everybody in that boat had the same opportunity that Peter had to walk on the water. The circumstances were the same. Jesus was the same. And the word was the same. But they chose to hold on to the boat. They chose to resist the risk. But Peter chose to step out on the word. And when Peter took that risk, he stepped out on the word. He also stepped into a brand new anointing. He stepped into a supernatural water walking anointing. He began moving and walking and operating in the same realm, the same anointing that Jesus was functioning in. And I want to tell you something. That anointing of God comes at extremely high price. It's going to cost your flesh. Oh, I want God to use me. I want God to anoint me and do this and do that. He will, but you're going to have to empty out. So many times we're hollering, God, I need you to do something. Our hands are full of everything else. And there's no place for God in our life. God says, empty yourself out and let me fill you back up. Amen? Amen. Listen. On that point here. Jesus did force Peter to get out of the boat. He didn't threaten Peter. He didn't condemn the other disciples for not walking in the water. Jesus simply came to them all in a way that he presented an opportunity for them to move to another level of their faith. He created an avenue for them to step from one realm of anointing to another. He called them to a higher experience, a higher manifestation of his power in their life. But only one took that step. Only one took the risk. And that risk separated Peter from the rest of the disciples. Two people read the same Bible. One sees reasons to love, the other sees the reasons to hate. One sees unity, the other sees division. One finds prejudice, the other equality. One discovers compassion, the other indifference. One goodwill, the other knowledge. Two people, one book. One book, two views. The book is a mirror. That reflection is you. Amen? Are we going to be the one that hears Jesus and does the impossible while everybody else sits around and watches? So you have to make that choice. You've got to draw the line between going to be a doer and a watcher. Between a boat sitter and a water walker. Somebody said, well, I'm afraid I might get wet. Well, that's a risk you're going to have to take. If you're going to walk on water, you might get wet. You probably will. That's just a risk. Do you know what? I made my mind up a long time ago. I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat sitter. I really get wet trying to do something for God and spend the rest of my life in a dry boat and never experience the supernatural power of God. Man. God didn't call us to be pew sitters, church. He called us to go out into the world. He preached this other night. He gave us a commission to go out in the world and make disciples of all men. How are they going to be made disciples if we don't do what we're supposed to be doing? I'd rather have experienced one day, one hour, one minute walking on the water than a lifetime of sitting in a dry boat. And I prophesy, I declare to you that there's a new stirring in their spirit. Many who've been comfortable and satisfied with the boat of mediocrity or religious expectation and of traditions of men of getting uncomfortable, the spirit is calling, come up hither, come up higher. The world needs to see Jesus. They don't need to see the weak. They need to see the powerful, anointed church of God move. That's what the world needs to see. Amen. Right now, the world needs a church and God more than it ever has before. There's so many war and root and war and things that happen to Israel and all these things of pestilence and, and plagues and, and volcanoes and hurricanes. And all these, the world needs to see the answer, and the answer is Him. And many of 
God's people are realizing they weren't created for the confines and restrictions and limitations of a born nor religion. In other words, a lot of us are discovering our destiny. We're discovering our purpose. We're discovering the power that resides. This, we sing songs all the time. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. Well, listen, he didn't give just to live in you. He gave so he could help you, so you could pour it out on somebody else and they can help them. So many times we're so for all oh, I want to offend somebody. You know what? You say somebody can go to hell, let them get offended. Amen. Some of us were discovering that we're not chickens, that we're eagles. Yes. Chickens are always looking down the ground, picking on the eagles are always looking up. And what do you tell us to do? Look up, your redemption draws nigh. Amen. Amen. And you can live, you can live on a lower pain as a chicken, but your evil spirit's never going to be satisfied. My father told his daughter, Congrats on your congratulations, on your graduation. I bought you a car a while back. I want to see, I want you to have it. But now, before I give it to you, take it to a car dealer in the city and sell it. See how much they offer. The girl came back to her father and said, they offered me $10,000 because it looks very old. father said, okay, now take it to the pawn shop. The girl returned to her father and said, the pawn shop offered me $1,000 because it's a very old car and a lot of work needs to be done. The father told her to join a passionate car club with experts and show them the car. So the girl drove it to the passionate car club. She returned to her father a few hours later and told him, some of the people in there offered me $100,000 because it's a rare car that's in good condition. Then the father said, I want to let you know that you're not worth anything if you're not in the right place. If you're not appreciated, do not be angry. That means you're in the wrong place. Don't stay in a place where no one sees your value. Moral of the story, know your worth and know you are valued. A diamond doesn't shine on the bottom of a cage. If you've got big plans and a burning desire to live a life most people only dream about, you got to do things differently. When people zig, you got to zag. When everybody else is digging for gold, you got to sell the shovels. Amen? Amen. 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 Listen, some of y'all hearing this message right now, you can't figure it out. You're uncomfortable. You're uneasy. You're kind of edgy. You're kind of irritable. Nothing really satisfies you. You're not satisfied with what you need or the job you have or the car you drive. You leave church feeling like something's missing. And you won't blame the pastor, you won't blame the praise and worship team, or the teacher, or the evangelist. But the truth is, it's not their fault. A different job, different food, or a different church, or more money isn't going to fix it. The problem is your spirit has heard Jesus say, come. And your spirit wants to break free from your flesh, and everything that's holding you into captivity. It's the anointing that is calling you. It's the anointing of God that's pulling you. What is the anointing you say? It's the power of God to do the will of God. God will anoint you with his power to enable you to do what he called you to do. Amen? Amen. Listen, it's that same anointing that pulled Peter out of that boat. It's the same word that called Peter to a life in the supernatural. And I know you can talk about Peter that he started to sink if you want to, but I prefer to talk about the Peter that walked on the water. Amen? Amen. He cast out devils. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He preached the inauguration and dispensation of the Holy Ghost, and 3,000 souls were saved. That's the Peter I want to talk about, church. Yes. I want to talk about the Peter, the man who was willing to take a risk, the man who let go of everything to take a hold of the Word of God. He had to let go of the safe place. He had to get out of the boat. He had to take a risk. Everything's to step out trusting Jesus. He did the impossible as long as his focus was on Jesus. When he looked at the circumstances, he began to say, listen, God has told some of us to step out of the boat. God wants to do something that people told you is impossible in your life. And he said, Peter stepped out of the boat, and he was able to do the impossible as long as his focus was on Jesus. But when he looked at the storm, he got back into looking at the natural thing. He looked at the circumstances. He looked at the situation. And what did it do? It caused him to sink. But even when he began to sink, Jesus was right there and reached down. Amen. If you keep your focus on God, there's nothing you can't do. If you get a look at your circumstance, your situation, the devil will tell you, oh, that's not going to work for you. Who do you think you are? You know what you need to tell the devil? I'm a child of the king. Right. He said, all things are possible. I can believe it. And I'm believing right now. Amen? Amen. Amen. Like I said earlier, we may never jump out of the boat like Peter and walk on water. 
But at some point in our faith journey, God is going to give you the opportunity to launch into the supernatural. You're going to hear him say, come. And it's going to give you just as crazy and just as reckless. And some people are going to criticize you. Some people will call you crazy. Some people are going to make fun of you. Some people are going to forecast your failure. Listen, you're going to have to decide, is it worth the risk of it? If you live your life to please people, you're going to be like a yo-yo. You're going to be up and down all your life. Because you can't please people. You've got to do what God's telling you to do. What's in your heart. What, listen, when you stand before God, you can't, well, Pastor Joy told me this. No, God's going to, you've been standing naked before God. And you're going to see your whole life go before you. You're going to see every opportunity that God gave you that you rejected him. You're going to see all the times that he sent somebody across your path or he spoke a word to you and you rejected him. You're not going to have any excuses on that day. So it doesn't matter what everybody else says or does. What is God telling you? What is the word God is speaking to you? God spoke it to the words of people. He's told you to get to do this. He's all, oh, I can't do that. God says, yes, you can. I would never call you if you couldn't do it. Amen? At some point, church, you've got to make a choice. Are you going to live by what man created? The job, the position, the reputation? Are you going to live by what created man? Hebrews 11, 3 says, through faith we understand that the world were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. God is spirit. He spoke and he created. So everything that we see, everything we hold so dear, was created from the spiritual realm. He said things that we see were created by the things we cannot see, church. This world's going to pass away. All the things we've collected, all the things we've had, all that's going to pass away. The only thing that's going to stand is what you give to the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Somebody's going to get out of the boat. Somebody's going to make a decision to take a risk to go higher, to walk by faith and not by sight. Somebody today is going to move in what I call crazy faith. It's the kind of faith that will let go of everything and take a hold of one word from God. Sometimes you've got to let go of your pride. You've got to let go of your ego. Yeah. You've got to let go of what people say and think about you, church. Yeah. You've got to let go of past hurts, past disappointments, Amen. past defeats. Amen? Yeah. Let go of those things. Listen, what good are they doing? We were talking about this today, this morning. We talking about unforgiveness. So many of the church have got unforgiveness toward people. Is that unforgiveness worth going to hell for? That un as long as you hold unforgiveness for somebody, you're allowing that person that hurts you to keep you in prison, to keep you in bondage. Right. When you forgive it, let go of it, you're free. Right. And to hold on to what? Listen, if I've got something in Pastor Joy and me holding it, it's not going to hurt her, it's going to hurt me. It's going to separate me from my prayer to her. It's going to open the door for the devil to come to my life. Some people say, why did God let this happen? He didn't, you did. You opened the door. And even God says, if you don't forgive, I can't forgive you. Is it really worth it? What are they doing? I'm not making a lot of what they, some of y'all gone through some horrible things. I'm not making a lot of, I'm just saying, is it really worth that? I don't think so. Amen. 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 That one word from Jesus saved Peter's life and probably everybody else in the boat. Church, I want you to raise your hands right now. I want you to praise God for some crazy people. Come on, let's praise God for some crazy people that's going to believe Him by faith. Yeah. I mean, people who are willing to risk everything for the Word of God. Amen? Yes, Lord, amen. we thank you this morning. We thank you for your Word this morning. I mean, people who will answer the call into the unknown, unknown people who will say yes to God. God, I don't know where you're sending me. I don't know what you want to do with my life, but it's not my life no more. I surrender to you. So whatever you want me to do, when you say come, I'm going to go wherever you send me. Yes. Come on, give us some praise in here. Amen? Amen. You're in pretty good company when you do that. Abraham, all the apostles, Joseph, Daniel, the three Hebrew children, even Jesus himself are in that group. That's a pretty good crowd to run with, isn't it? Amen. I believe somebody's going to hear the voice of Jesus right now. He's saying, come, let's do this together. He's going to take his super and your natural and cause a supernatural thing to happen. Amen? Amen. He's telling somebody, he's speaking to somebody, he's been telling you, it's time for you to go on the mission field. It's time for you to start that business. It's time to build that church. It's time to write that book. It's time to let go and go back to school and get your degree. Yes. It's time to start moving in the gifts of the Spirit. Yes. 
Amen? It's time to start believing God for that healing that you need. Yes. It's time to believe, start believing God for that get deliverance that you need. If you're bound in an addiction, I don't care what it is, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You just got to apply it and let it manifest in our life. Sometimes, church, we got to start believing God for those prodigals to come home too. Yes. Amen? When Jesus says come, he's inviting you to take a hold of his power, his wisdom, and his ability. I believe there's a calling going out in the spirit right now for men and women to go that safe life and step up into the faith life. To take a risk in order to walk with God where you've never walked before. And to see what you've never seen and do what you've never done. And listen, we need to do these things now because things are only going to get harder. Yes. It was all, it's going to get better. No, it's not. The Bible says it's not going to get better. Church is going to get worse. He said in the last days, and I believe we're in the last yes, days. And I know you've heard that all your life, but all the, all the pieces of the puzzle are starting to come together. Amen. And if we can't do it now, we sure won't be able to do it when we're in that situation. Ooh, you need to start listening to God, hearing God for yourself, doing what God's telling you to do. Amen? Amen. Peter didn't sink the church, and neither would you. Jesus would not have called him if he couldn't hold you up. Listen. Jesus has been holding you life up for a long time. Amen. And he'll hold you up. When Jesus says come, everything you need to accomplish the work is contained in that word. He wouldn't tell you come if he wasn't going to empower you to do what he called you to do. But there's one question you'll have to answer, and nobody can answer it for you. Is it worth the risk? I want to say something right here. In the risk is where you're going to see miracles. In the risk is where you're going to see the power of God manifested. And the risk is where the glory of God is going to be revealed. And the risk is where the devil is going to be humiliated and Jesus is going to be exalted. And the risk is where the kingdom of God comes in power. Fiery, effective Bible faith is born and forged in the fires of risk and adversity. If you didn't ever have anything come against you, you'd never know what God could do with you. And even if, if you read on with ourselves, it's through the adversity that we go closer to God. When you're on the mountaintop, you think you've arrived. You don't need Jesus. But when you're going through the fire of adversity, you're crying out to him. Amen? I always say this. We're better Christians when our back's up against the wall. That's right. Amen? I'm almost through for those of watching the clock, okay? What's the difference between a life of the miraculous and walking in water or spending a life sitting in a boat? It's called the risk of faith. Believe in God for something you haven't been able to believe in before. Something you can't accomplish in yourself that only God can do. When a woman had the issue of blood, she suffered all those years, spent all the money she had, and doctor, doctors couldn't help her. But she heard about Jesus. And she said to herself, if I can but touch the hem of his garment. The hem of his garment represented the word of God. The blue thread running around the bottom of that uh, gown represents the word of God. And she said, if I can just touch the word, I'll be healed. And what she did, she pressed through the crowd. She wouldn't even supposed to be out there. She was unclean. They could have stoned her to death. But she didn't care. She didn't things to hold her back. She wanted what Jesus had. She pressed through the crowd and she touched Jesus. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And the disciples said, Man, there are people all around you touching me. Somebody touched me by faith. This morning, somebody's going to reach out and they're going to touch Jesus by faith. And you know what happened to her? She was healed again. And Jesus comes to her he said, Your faith has made you hard. Church, it's your faith that's going to accomplish what God wants to do in our lives. It says, through faith we have overcome the world. Amen? Amen. Well, right now you're probably thinking, well, Pastor Roger, what's it going to, what, is it, what is it that makes it so important for me to take the risk? In other words, what do I stand to lose if I decide just to sit this one out and just let Jesus come by? Good question. If you decide just to sit this one out, it may be the last opportunity you ever have to tap into the greater glory and become a partner of the Holy Spirit in the miracle working power of God. My mom was highly unknown to God. People oh, I'd like to be like her. You pay a price to get there. It doesn't come easy. It's well worth it. Everywhere she went, people were drawn to her. They wanted, they wanted to hear about the Jesus she had. And she had such a way of relating to people, making them understand. If I decide to sit this one out, just let Jesus pass me by, church. Is that all I stand to lose? If I let the invitation pass by, 
No, we may lose a generation. If we don't preach the gospel to our children and our grandchildren, you're not going to hear it, church. Even this, I'm going to say this, I'm really trying to close it. Because of these secular liberal professors in a lot of the colleges, not all, a lot of the colleges, they have so brainwashed our kids that now they want to come against the Jewish people. And yet God says those that bless Israel will be blessed. Those that curse Israel will be cursed. But they want to come because they're so brainwashed. But guess what? God is showing up by the Holy Spirit all across this country on college campuses. You know why? Because they would, nobody but the Holy Spirit, nobody but something supernatural, spiritual, can touch those kids in such a way to transform them and change the way of their thinking. The Bible says, a man thinketh so as he becomes. But you know what? God's not leaving them. He's coming personally in the form of the Holy Spirit. And he's anointed. There's over 3,000 people in one place that were gathering and they were baptizing and people were getting saved. And listen, they didn't have some big known prophet. It was just a group of kids coming together and the Holy Spirit manifesting the supernatural. Right. Amen? Amen? Listen, if we let God pass us by and we don't do what he tells us to do, we stand to lose a nation. You stand to lose your children and your grandchildren to a very wicked, evil, Marxist idea, ideology that will destroy this country. You stand to lose your sons and daughters and your grandchildren to not only an ideology, but in fact a satanic agenda to destroy not only the physical identity of our kids, but their mental, emotional, and spiritual identity as well. Look at it. Our society is trying to turn out children, not male or female, you're binary. God did not make binary. God made male and female. But because of society we're living on, we won't try to brainwash our kids so we lose that generation. You stand to lose the freedom of worshiping God according to the dictates of your own heart. Instead, you'll be under government supervision that will prevent you just enough freedom to be religious, but not enough to worship God in spirit and in truth. <laughs> You stand to lose the legal right to pray and to worship God and read your Bible, or even own a Bible. We stand to lose the glorious privilege of being able to share your faith privately or publicly. You stand to lose the freedom to follow your dreams and fulfill your destiny. You stand to lose every promise, every benefit that Jesus paid for with his blood and his sacrifice. You stand to lose the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, because the anointing is for doers, not sinners. Amen? I got two stories I'm reading and we're closing this, I promise. Have you ever thought about this? In a hundred years, like in 2023, we will all be buried with our relatives and friends. Strangers will live in our home we fought so hard to build. And they'll own everything we have today. All our possessions will be unknown, unborn, including our car we spent a fortune on. And we'll probably be scrapped, preferably in the hands of an unknown collector. Our descendants will hardly or hardly know who we are, nor will they remember us. How many of us know our grandfather's father? After we die, we will remember for a few more years, and then we're just a portrait on someone's bookshelf, and a few later our history, our photos and deeds disappear into history. We won't even be memories. If we pause one day and analyze this question, perhaps we can understand how ignorant and weak the dream to achieve it all was. If we could only think about this, surely our approaches, our thoughts would change. We would be different people. Always having more, no time for what's really valuable in this life. I change all this to live and enjoy the walks I've never taken, the hugs I didn't give, the kisses for our children, our loved ones, the jokes we didn't have time for. Those would certainly be the most beautiful moments to remember. After all, they would fill our lives with joy. And some of us, we waste a day after day with greed, selfishness, and intolerance. Every minute of life is priceless and never be repeated. So take time to enjoy. Be grateful for it and celebrate your existence. Church, this morning I believe there's one question that's got to be answered. And nobody can answer it for you. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the risk? I copied this from our Facebook pages from Intellectual Ministries. It says, we often come up empty because those sources lack ultimate eternal knowledge. And so the guidance and peace we desperately seek remain elusive. We need something better. We need truth. The Bible meets this need because from beginning to end, it reveals God to us, assures of his, uh, assures of, of his love, leads us to salvation, and shows us how to live. The Bible is much more than history or textbook or storybook. It's more than a collection of poetry and wisdom. It's the inspired, living word of God, timeless, infallible, and trustworthy. 
The Lord come, can and does use people and resources to help us grapple with life complexity. Yet the wisdom we receive from them should always line up with the Bible teaching. Where have you turned recently for the answer to difficult questions? How much is Scripture factored in? So many times we look for answers everywhere else except where we need to go to the Word and see what God says about it. When a baby's born, it's a call for celebration, but also anticipation. Before discharging the family, the doctor checks that everything is as it should be. And then once at home, mom and dad watch carefully to make sure the baby eats and sleep well and meets milestones. In the days and months and years to come, parents pay attention to the child's development, not just physical, but also cognitive and emotional. If there aren't signs of growth, something is probably wrong. The same is true of our life in Christ. When we first received Jesus as Lord, we're spiritual infants, beginning a wonderful new life in Him. But from then on, it's important to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, 2 Peter 3.18. Otherwise, we can be easily misled by wrong teaching, doubt, and temptation. Growing in a relationship with Jesus requires we fill our life with practices that promote good spiritual health. These include regular worship, prayer, Bible study, fellowship with other believers, serving with your gifts and your talents. Such disciplines nourish us. They're like vitamins and exercise for the soul. How has your spiritual growth been loosened? What changes would help strengthen your faith? Think about that. Some of us have been serving God for a long time. Church, have we grown? Have we matured? Has our lives changed? Are we as on fire for God now as we were when we first got saved? I'm going to pray this over everybody in here. I pray that every chain is upon you be broken in the name of Jesus. I pray that every stronghold, every sin pattern, every wall will crumble. I pray that all darkness in your mind will leave. I pray that every heavy yoke will be lifted. I pray that every generational curse will be broken. I pray that every lying tongue will be silenced. I pray that all sickness will be healed. I pray that every distraction will cease. I pray for deliverance over you. I pray for healing. I pray for peace. I pray for a sound mind. I pray for the goodness of God to surround you. I pray, I pray for a hunger and a fire to burn within you. In the name of Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. Give God some praise and glory. <laughs> Just a moment, we're going to pray our last time. The altars are going to be open. If the Holy Spirit ministers to you, you feel like you need to come and spend some time with God, I say the altars are always open. And then we'll have prayer afterwards. I want to reach out to those on Facebook and uh, YouTube. If you feel like the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, God says if you believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sin, and you confess with your mouth that he rose again, that you might have eternal life. And you confess with your mouth, he says you shall be saved. So if you believe from your heart, it's not a matter of just saying, okay, I'm going to join the church. It's a heart change. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, he says you shall be saved. Do that today if you haven't done that. Guys, go ahead and play that song. Listen to the words of this song. Let the Holy Spirit minister to you.